Amen. All right. 2 Corinthians 12, let's open with a word of prayer and let's dig into the word. Heavenly Father, we do, we come before you. And Lord, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'd give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say to each and every one of us this morning. We thank you for the word of God, that it's living and breathing and sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, we do want to lift up Charmaine as she prepares for her chemotherapy. We just pray, Lord, that She would come through it well, that, Lord, you would be glorified in the midst of it, and, Lord, that she give her strength in the midst of it, Lord. I know how debilitating it can be. And, Lord, we pray for Donna as well. We thank you that she's come through her surgery. Lord, I thank you for the helps ministry in this church. So many people who are stepping up to come alongside people. We just thank you for that. Such a picture of your kingdom. So, Lord, now as we go to your word, be our teacher. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said... Amen. All right, so 2 Corinthians, uh, we're coming near the end of it. Uh, I know we have a few new faces in here this morning, just a short review. Just know that Corinth was a very wicked city that was very wealthy. It was also a city that was chasing after every doctrine and chasing after every vain philosophy that came along. And sadly, the church had gotten so far away, the Apostle Paul had planted the church and been there for 18 months and then went to go and plant other churches because that's what Paul did. And now five years had gone by before 1 Corinthians, and he got a letter back letting him know that the church was struggling and some of the things they were struggling with. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about. And again, I would encourage you, it deals with marriage and love and and how you treat your, your brother and suing each other. All the CDs are on the back table. They're free. Help yourself. 2 Corinthians is in response to the first letter. A lot of people... Uh, repented, praise God, but a lot of people attacked Paul. And here's what happens. When you deliver a message people don't want to hear, they'll attack the messenger. And Paul had been under attack, and he was under attack from the outside, but he was also under attack from the inside. There were these, uh, you know, eminent apostles. There were these other Uh, teachers who came along and were adding to the gospel saying, well, yeah, okay, the gospel plus these things or you're not really saved. And they were making a lot of money off of the church and they started slamming Paul as being somebody who was uneducated, what couldn't be any further from the truth, uh, not quite as enlightened, not as quite as charismatic. Now in the last, these last four, these four chapters here, starting in chapter 10, Paul's kind of having to really address these false teachers in a very straight and direct way. And part of what we saw him do in the last couple of weeks, and he'll do it some more today, something he hated doing. He has to kind of defend himself, or he called it foolish boasting. See, Paul didn't like talking about himself. He liked talking about Jesus. And you know, that's a lesson for all of us to learn. Can I get an amen? We love to talk about me. Amen? And we'll let you, you'll be talking to us, we're already talking about something, we're already thinking about how we can respond to what you just said with something better about me. And the reality is that too often we focus on ourselves when guys, it's never about us, it's always about him. So Paul does have to defend himself a little bit here, and he's going to call it foolish boasting because he has to address the attacks that are being made against him that just aren't true. And so this morning, if you have the outline, grab it. I tiled the message this morning Fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty. You know, it's been said, you've heard me say it many times, you know, you, you find out uh, what, what's in the heart of a Christian when we go through difficulties and trials. You know, it's been said that we're like tea bags, right? You know, you find out what's on the inside when you put it in some hot water, amen? And the same is true for us. It's, it's easy to stand for the Lord when everything's good. It's easy to, to be the cruise ship Christian when you know, all the kids are healthy, you got money in the bank, the marriage is good, everything's wonderful. You know what? But it, we find out where we are spiritually when the attacks start coming, when the trials of life start coming, when we go through the difficulties of life. And Paul's going to address that this morning. And as he addresses it, my prayer is that for all of us, we would, have it, we would take away and apply to our lives, how should we respond as believers in the midst of great difficulty and trials? But we're also going to learn from the Apostle Paul, again, just to make a stand for the things of God and not to be ashamed of the gospel. This past week, I was in Dallas for a week for my company. Um, they, they did us in, uh, in regions, and so there were about 500 salespeople there. And what's amazing, you know, put 500 salespeople in a room, what do you think that's like, Right? And play loud music and do stuff, right? And so many divine appointments, I don't know if I can count them off the top of my head. 
So many opportunities to speak into people's lives from the shuttle driver who picked me up at the airport and we were talking about Jesus and I prayed with them. On the plane, the lady sitting near me, her husband and her father had just died. Opportunity for the gospel. Guys, there's opportunities for the gospel every single day. And you know what? We miss them because we're so focused on us that we miss out on what God wants to do through us. Can I get an amen to that? And we're going to see Paul making some stands for the Lord. So let's take a look quickly. Again, uh, fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty. Sources of true success in ministry. And the word success, successful ministry, just remember minister, ministry just means to serve others. Amen? It means to be a servant. And how do we do that? How can we have a fruitful ministry? How can we have fruitful lives in times of difficulty and faithful lives? First of all, by having an eternal perspective. Do you guys know that heaven's better? Can I get an amen to that? And I have an idea, I, not just an idea, I know that when we get to heaven, we are going to be blown away. Heaven is way better. And too often, I think we get caught in the trap of acting like this is the only life that matters. We had a couple heavy things happen to my family this week. And uh, first of all, I got a call while I was in Dallas that my mom had fallen. She had broken her hip. She was in emergency surgery, and they didn't know if she was going to survive. I'm on the phone with my sister. So I'm talking to her. An hour after that phone call, I got a call from my wife that one of my sons had overdosed and that paramedics were in my house trying to revive him. Heaven's better. And you know, the trials of this life, we can either trust God and run to him or we can run from him. Can I get an amen? And you know, thankfully he's okay. Had to be hit with Narcan. He got put back in jail for six months. There's heavy consequences. And I share this with you just because, you know what? I'm your pastor, but I go through tri trials just like you do. Can I get an amen? amen? And as I pray for you, I covet your prayers for me. And as I talk to my son on the phone, I'm letting him know your, your son was almost raised without a father. And I'm reminding him of just the consequences of the choices that we make. And guys, you know why we make these choices? Because we're focused on the temporal instead of focusing on the eternal. Can I get an amen? And you know what? Our God is in control and our God is faithful and I trust him more than ever and I'm more determined to be about the kingdom of God when I go through trials than I am before the trial began. Can I get an amen to that? And too often what happens is we turn away and we allow ourselves to feel pity or, or anger or bitterness or whatever it may be. So we need to have an eternal focus, a true longing for heaven, and see your suffering and trials in light of eternity. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. I talked to my son who had done this, and he had been the one who had been sober the longest, and it was an absolute shock to all of us, including my poor wife who was watching it happen, and I'm a thousand miles away. And I said to him, you know what, son, can you imagine your son? Imagine your son being with paramedics and you don't know if he's going to live or not for 20 minutes. I just went through it. Guys, the choices we make impact more than just us. Amen? And it's, and it's in the midst of this, we need to have an eternal perspective. If the six months in jail changes life, it's all worth it. Can I get an amen? And if it's not, it's just postponing the inevitable. But we need to have an eternal focus in this life. When we go through this life daily, be, be heavenly minded. So heavenly minded that we do some earthly good. Uh, we also need to remain humble, broken, and desperate. See, when God uses you in a mighty way, there's a, there's, because of our pride, we can fall into the trap of thinking somehow we had something to do with it. And if we're not careful, we can start taking some credit for it. Amen? And we must never do that. And you know what? God brings things into our lives that keep us humble, broken, and desperate. And I had a couple of those in one night, an hour apart. It, you know, when you can't fix it on your own, it drives you to your knees, amen? It keeps you in a place where you're crying out to God. So we need to praise Him in the midst of the trials of life because we got to recognize, Lord, I can't do this without you. And then thirdly, having a great love and burden for people. You know, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? And here's the reality, that we are to love God and love people. And if we love God and love people, it will, it will order our day. If we love God and love people, it will change the priorities in our life. 
When Jesus comes first and others are second, we put ourselves last, we experience the joy of the Lord. And so Paul in this chapter, he's gonna talk about some things that we need to apply to our lives, and I love his example. And you know what? The apostle Paul was, was in Corinth for 18 months. How, how would you like to have Paul hang out with us for 18 months? Would that be worth the price of admission or what? Amen? To have a godly man who's so sold out for the Lord and sadly a little bit of time went by and they were already casting aside his message. And see, Paul's not defending himself, he's defending the gospel. See, Paul doesn't really care what they think of him. He just knows the attacks that are being made against him is attacking the message by attacking the messenger. And that's why he makes the stand that he makes. So let's begin there, looking at a fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty, sources of true success in ministry. It says there in verse, chapter 12, verse 1, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. The Corinthians had sunk to a point where they would only listen to the the boasting of these false teachers. And they were so charismatic that they drew a crowd. And too often, we, are, we fall into the same trap. You've heard me say it several times the last few weeks, that we look, we look more at the, charis, the charisma of the deliverer than the content of the message. I don't tend to get really political, but I don't know how many of you saw any of that debate of the Demo- Democratic Party. And everybody's talking about, oh, what a deliverer, what a great... They're, all, they're arguing over who is most pro-baby killing. Well, we'll let you kill your babies after they're born, if they're inconvenient. I mean, they're just off the chain. And what's happening is people are, are grading people based on the charisma of the deliverance and nothing about the content of the message. And the apostle Paul is saying, you know, it's, it's doubt, for me to boast, it's a doubtful thing. Why am I doing this? But the reality is, because they've attacked the message, by attacking the messenger, I have to make a stand for the truth. Now, one of the things that the false teachers did is they always had a new revelation. And by the way, that's something you'll see a lot from false teachers, that somehow God appeared to them and gave them a new revelation. Let me say it one more time. If it's new, it's not true. Amen? If it's true, it's not new. There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, God just changed his mind? That's not what happened. And so the reality is that Paul is going to talk about revelations that God had shown him in comparison to the revelations that these false teachers were bringing up. These false teachers were coming up with a new thing to draw a crowd into themselves, to be able to charge more money for their speeches. So what they were doing was something that was taking the eyes off of the Lord and putting them on themselves. And anytime you see a ministry that takes their eyes off, takes your eyes off of Jesus and puts it on a ministry or a man or a method, we've missed it. So Paul's gonna share that he too, out of deep concern for the well-being of these Uh, Corinthian believers and those who were struggling to get their attention off the false teachers and back on Jesus, he's going to share. says there are visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, the false teachers were undercutting Paul's ministry and said he was a lightweight, that all he does is teach doctrine. I, I would love to have that on my tombstone. Can I get an amen? All he does is teach doctrine, which, you know, that's biblical truth is a better word for doctrine. Can I get an amen to that? All he does is teach biblical truth. That's it. He doesn't, you know, when's the last time he waved a coat on somebody and they fell over and started gyrating? I hope that never happens in this church. Can I get an amen? (laughs) And too often in the world we live in today, they're focusing on the show and they're focusing on, 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 you know, the the entertainment that takes place. And Paul's going to let them know that, yes, he's had visions and revelations, but he was not one to boast in them, but he's going to hear to get the Corinthian church's focus back on Jesus. The word vision there means an appearing or something coming into view. Revelation there is where we get the word apocalypse, an uncovering, a laying bare, a disclosure of divine truth or a manifestation that comes directly from God. So Paul's vision, his revelation, is a source of motivation and determination in his ministry. We've talked about this before, but now we're going to hear Paul talk about it. See, Paul had been given a great motivation to serve the Lord, and it was first his love for the Lord, 
But he had also been given, you know, God had taken him from darkness into light. He was on the road to, you know, attack and persecute believers. He got knocked off his high horse. And now we see Paul in a position where he's arguably the greatest evangelist who's ever lived. And he's planting churches all over the known world. But what motivated this man? And sometimes we think, well, Paul just must have been a super, you know, he must have just been a supernatural guy. Well, no, Paul just had an eternal focus. And let me show you why his eternal focus was so strong. Look at verse 2. I know a man in Christ whom 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now, what's interesting to me is what he's about to share happened 14 years sooner, and it's the first time we hear Paul talking about it. Now, if what happened to Paul had happened to anyone else, uh, like in modern times, they'd be publishing books and going on, on, on shows and getting people to, you know, look at them in a different way and pay, throw money at them and to, you know, start a worldwide ministry of, I saw heaven and you didn't. And Paul instead, for 14 years, God had spoken to him, and he applied it to his own life. And now only when it's going to take the eyes off of the false revelations of the world and get the focus back on Jesus does he share it. And he says, I know a man in Christ, again, a Christian man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not just knowing about Christ, but knowing Christ. Let me ask you this morning, do you know Jesus, or do you just know about him? Is Jesus Christ your best friend? Is he the first thought on your mind when you wake up in the morning? Do you spend time daily in prayer and in his word? Do you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? Or is he an hour every other Sunday if there's not a football game on? You know, where is the Lord and the priority and the passion of your life? And Paul was in Christ. He's a Christian man. He was a godly man. He says 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body. So look, Paul is very transparent. He's like, I don't know if I physically inside my body was taken there or if God revealed it to me through some type of a vision. He's like, I don't fully understand it. All I can tell you is what I experienced. And, you know, I love this heart, too, because too often when people are too certain about things that seem to me to contradict the Word of God, they're just wrong. Can I get an amen? And notice even a humility here. He's being humble about it. You know, I, and so if you track back in the Bible 14 years earlier, to me, it's very clear that he's talking about the time when he was stoned to death in Lystra. So he went into Lystra. While he was there, he... He performed a miraculous work, actually, and the people in Lystra wanted to worship him. And Paul said, hey, yeah, not so much. And, and then he was preaching the gospel, and some of the same people that wanted to worship him as a god then drug him outside the city gates and threw rocks at him until he died, or at least until they thought he was dead. I personally think he died, because when you stone people, you don't take any chances that they might be alive. You throw extra rocks when you think they're done. We know that believers came around him and prayed for him. We know that Paul got back up. And where did he go? Right back into the city. Now, what I love about this, a couple of things. First of all, we're going to find out in this chapter right here why he had the boldness that he had. By the way, you get a glimpse of heaven, you're not afraid to go back. Can I get an amen to that? Dude, I've seen heaven way better than this place. Get some rocks. I'm right here. I ain't, going, I ain't even going to move. I'll be, a standard, I'll be a stationary target if you need it because you can't threaten me with heaven. Can I get an amen to that? But I love Paul's heart that he went back into Lystra. You know why? Because men don't tell us where to go or what to do or when to leave. God does. And if men say you need to leave and God says, no, I'm staying. And that was Paul's heart. Men tried to get me out of here. God sent me here. I'm staying here until God says different. And I love that heart. How about you? I love that passion. I love that commitment to the things of God. And we need more of that today. You know, they just, they're just passing a law in California that's going to make it against the law to say that homosexuality is a sin. I'll be preaching it here until I go to heaven. You know, to say that transgenderism is, is, per, is, per, is perverse. Uh, you know, guys, we love, do we love the homosexuals? Do we love everybody? What's the answer? But we're going to say, call sin, and we'll call my sin too, not just other people's sin. Amen? 
pride, anger, bitterness, adultery, lust, fornication, gossip, whatever. Let's go down the list. And when they start telling you, you can't say that sin anymore and you can't speak out against that anymore, we don't obey man. We obey man until man tells us to disobey God. We obey the laws of the land until they tell us to disobey the laws of God. And here's the apostle Paul. They said, you can't come, you're out of the city, right back in. Why? Because I obey God, not man. And by the way, we're indestructible until God's through with us. Can I get an amen to that? So God's not through with him. And his friends, you know, surrounded him weeping. They prayed for him. He went right back into the city. And again, he was, it's interesting, the word there in, in uh, what happens in Lystra is he was caught up. And that's the same word where we get, you know, harpazo raptura, which means raptured, snatched away. And, you know, so he was caught up into the heavens. Guys, I'm looking forward to the caught up. How about you? People say the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, caught up is, I'll, more, I'll, I'll use that. Can I get an amen? I'm praying for the caught up. Now, notice it says here, he was caught up to the what? Third heaven. Now, so there's some bad theology that says there's multiple heavens in the way we think of heaven. Uh, the Mormon church teaches there's three heavens. There's a heaven for the bad people, a better heaven for the Christian non-Mormons, and then the third heaven is for the Mormons. That's not what this is about. The, third, the three heavens, what are they? Well, you have the, you know, the first heaven is where the birds fly, the atmospheric heavens. The second heaven is where the stars are, the stellar heavens. And the third heaven is beyond this universe, outside of time and space, where God is. Can I get an amen to that? I remember when uh, reading about when the Russians were the first ones to get into outer space, they, they radioed back, we're, we're up here in the heavens and we don't see God anywhere. You're not, you haven't gotten there yet, bro. <laughs> you haven't gone far enough, amen? And so it's not just the heavens the way we think of it. So Paul went to heaven, not a high, he wasn't sitting in a high tree and he wasn't sitting on the moon, he was in the presence of Almighty God. Can I get an Amen. So that's the third heaven, the presence of Almighty God. And then he says there in verse 3, And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of it, but I do not know. God knows. He was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is unlawful for a man to utter. So Paul didn't know if he was in his body or not. He said, God knows that's all that matters but he was caught up into paradise. Now in the Bible, we've seen the word again, the word caught up there again is the word for rapture, raptured. Paradise is the word used to describe the dwelling place of the righteous dead prior to Jesus' death on the cross. You guys remember this, right? When Jesus turned to the man on the, the thief on the cross, when he said, will you remember me when you come to, into your kingdom? He said, today you'll be with me where? In paradise. Now, paradise uh, was also synonymous with Hades, but not hell. There's a false gospel that says when Jesus died on the cross, he had to go down into hell and be born again and pay for our sins and then come back. Nonsense. Can I get an amen to that? Jesus died on the cross. He said, it is what? Finished. Finished. Paid in full. Now, Hades, though, if you look at uh, Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, uh, Lazarus is a beggar who had a relationship with God and the rich man didn't and they both die and the rich man is in torment and he's looking across the great gulf and he sees Lazarus in paradise, also referred to as Abraham's bosom. And it was there that you know, he cried out, can he come to me? And he said, go tell my family. So there was memory in hell, that's pretty heavy, amen. Remembering that they had heard the truth, wanting your family to know the truth. Every time I do a funeral, I share Luke 16. Because whether, you're, whether the person who died knew the Lord or didn't know the Lord, they would tell you, get to know the Lord. Surrender your life to Jesus, amen? But you know what? When Jesus said to set the captives free, what he did is he ushered the Old Covenant, Old Testament saints who had believed in the coming Messiah into what we now call heaven, Amen? And this is where the misunderstood mind thinks of purgatory. Purgatory is not biblical either. Amen? When someone, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you don't, you're not laying in the ground asleep, and you're not wandering around, man, I wish my relatives would give some money to the church so I can get to heaven. No, that's not happening. <laughs> can I get an amen to that? They're not having to pray some prayers or, or you know, say 500 Hail Marys so you can get into heaven. No, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Amen? So he got a glimpse of heaven, and notice what it says. He didn't say, I saw some things, which he no doubt did, but he said, I heard things that I can't even utter. 
What he heard in heaven was so amazing that he knew any attempt to describe it would be a disaster. He knew that the only, only thing he, would, he could do to heaven by trying to describe it is taint it. And so what he said is, what I heard, there's just no words. But what he heard obviously impacted him. Can I get an amen to that? What he heard and what he saw changed him and made him a man who you couldn't threaten him with heaven. A man who started a revival or a riot everywhere he went. Why? Because he had such a focus on eternity that there's nothing you could do to stop him to do, you know, they would have Paul arrested, he'd be surrounded by people, and he'd be like, sweet, i got a big crowd. Can I say a few things? I mean, this guy looked at everything as an opportunity for the gospel. Don't you want to be more like Paul? Can I get an amen? Remember last chapter, though, the things he went through to get there, amen? Fit, you know, 40 lashes minus one, and days and nights in the deep, and hunger and all the things he went through. So the apostle Paul is saying, you know what, and I know it's hard for him to do it, but you have revelations? Dude, I would... I was in the presence of Almighty God. And notice he only brings it up not to bring praise to himself, but to get people's eyes back on Jesus. And I truly believe that anytime there's a revelation of any kind or anything that's miraculous in that way, it's not to draw attention to us, but to draw attention to him. And that's why it concerns me when somebody, you know, a miracle takes place and then they write a book and make millions of dollars and have everybody praising them and that something's wrong. Can I get an amen to that? So the focus needs to be on Jesus and Paul's bringing them back to where it needs to be. Get your eyes back on the Lord. Have an eternal perspective. I heard inexpressible words, not lawful from man to utter. There's no words, there's no language to describe what he saw or experienced when he was in heaven. There's a story of a blind girl, I read this years ago, who had been blind since birth. And then when she was a teenager, she had sur a surgery that uh, allowed her to regain her sight. And then when they removed the bandages slowly, eventually she could see and she looked around the room and she went out and looked out the window and she said to her mother, why didn't you tell me how beautiful it was? I had no idea. And her mom said, how do you describe color to a blind person who's never seen color? How do you describe clouds to someone who's never seen one? Hey, anything I would have said to you would have fallen, fall short. And so true of heaven, I can't wait. I'm ready to get blown away in heaven. How about you? I I'm ready to just be like, whoa. Amen? By the way, and I get to live here forever, hanging out with the creator of the universe. Does it get any better than that? Is that not the ultimate 401k plan? Amen? It's heaven, and Paul has a heavenly perspective. It's not lawful. It would be a crime for me to try to describe to you what God showed me in heaven. What awaits for us should make this suffering, it will make this suffering a distant memory. I don't think we're going to be in, we're not going to be in heaven comparing what trials we went through. Can I get an amen to that? What did you go through down there? Well, I went through this. It's nonsense. This is but light affliction when compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Can I get an amen to that? I can't wait. Heaven is so much better. And the trials of this life are nothing compared to what awaits us in eternity. Whatever Paul saw and heard, it gave him an eternal focus. A true longing for heaven, again, went right back into the city. How tragic that so many because of their misconception of heaven, grieve the way that we, that we can when Christians die. Can I just say this again, one more time? So here's another divine appointment. I had a divine appointment with the guy, the shuttle driver. Um, we started talking, he said, he, all he said to me was, I've been driving people from your company all day. Something different about you. What is it? And I'm like, well, the only thing that can be different about, it's, it's not the hair, okay? You know, <laughs> I said, it's gotta be Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I knew it. And he goes, I got a question. And we pulled over, I shared with him, I prayed with him, we're hugging, he's crying, I gave him my card, he might be watching, hey Brian. And uh, so the reality is, divine appointments. Then on, my, then on the flight, there was a lady, as I said, was sitting next to me, her father had just died, and she was going to a funeral. And I'm sharing this message that I've been studying all week. Guys, here's the good news, heaven's better. And I promise you, your dad's doing better than he ever has. He, he was an on-fire Christian. And guys, I think too often, well, he died too soon. If I die tomorrow, it's not too soon, I'm good. Amen? Throw me in a hefty bag, put me on the curb, celebrate. I won't be thinking about you. You don't need to worry about me. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'll be so focused on Jesus, I'll see you when you get there. Amen? I hope you all come. Can I get an amen to that? 
But the reality is too often that we have such an earthly focus that we hang on to everything about this life and, and sometimes to the point of losing sight of, again, now, should we be good stewards of our bodies here? What's the answer? Should we go to the doctor and do it? Because we want to be faithful with the t- vapor of time. We've got to serve Jesus. We want to be about it for him. Amen? But at the same time, when that time comes to an end, it's better. We ought to have an eternal perspective. What a blessing. We won't have to deal with a sinful, fallen world anymore. No more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, no more suffering. In the presence of God Almighty. And again, those who've gone before you, don't weep for them. Weep for yourselves that you miss them. I miss my dad every day. My best friend. Pastor for 60 years. Most godly man I've ever met. Uh, Best Bible teacher I've ever heard. I'm so thankful for the blessing of being his son. And I'm so glad he's in heaven. Because he's where he always longed to be. I wouldn't bring him back here for anything. It'd be so selfish of me to try to do so. So the first thing we need to have is that eternal focus. Look at verse five and six. Of such one I will boast of this vision I had. Yet myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me or or to be or hears from me. See, Paul knew that while God had shown him something mighty, that what he really did is he showed it to Paul for Paul. Do you think God was preparing Paul for something? Can I get an amen? Because after that, Paul went through so many trials, and that revelation that came from God specifically for him gave him the strength to do what God had called him to do. And I believe the same thing is true in each of our lives. Now, again, I've had a lot of my friends, even my pastor friends say, you know what, Pastor Dave, one of the gifts you have, you have a gift of faith. I say, okay, but I want to tell you something. The trials of life have deepened my faith. Can I get an amen to that? When you go through difficulty and trials, when you can't fix it yourself, it gives you greater faith. And I'm not talking about faith and faith. I'm not talking about a faith that if I believe it, then God has to do it. That's nonsense. But it's faith in Almighty God. Can I get an amen? amen. And when we have a deepened faith, there's not a trial on this planet that will take our eyes off of the Lord. Can I get an amen to that? Even if a, when somebody else falls, a lot of people fall with them. If a pastor falls, especially people fall with them. Let me just tell you, I don't like, it breaks my heart when anybody falls. But I'm telling you right now, if you all fall, I'm not going. Can I get an amen to that? You need to have your own faith that is based on your relationship with the Lord and your faith is in Him. Your faith is not in a church. It's not in a pastor. It's not even in other believers. Your faith is in Christ. And that faith should never waver. Amen? And guys, that we should have our own relationship with the Lord, and that was the kind of faith that Paul had. He could have blown away these false apostles with his visions, with his many revelations. He had other revelations in in addition to the one he just shared, but he didn't want people to put any emphasis whatsoever upon him, upon the messenger. He wanted the focus to only be on the message, where to touch not the glory. And again, many make up books, make up stories about heaven, and again, I wanted to make it really clear. They said, oh, I went up to heaven. I had a guy come to my church and told me, I am the new bishop of Santa Cruz. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I went up to heaven, and God put a scepter on my shoulder and told me, you're the new bishop of Santa Cruz. Now go down there and oversee all the churches. And he had two people with him. Yeah, it really happened, yeah. I go, you did not go to heaven, and God did not put a scepter on you, and you are not the bishop of Santa Cruz. That is nonsense. That is total nonsense. How dare you? You're touching the Lord's... Let me read the Bible to you. No man has seen God at any time. No man. That, no man includes you. Can I get an amen? And we live in a world today that anything miraculous happens, they want to somehow act like they had something to do with it, and they want fame to come in their direction. And if anybody could have said, I've had more interactions with God, I've seen more miracles, I've seen God do more mighty things, it was Paul, and all Paul ever wanted to do was point people to Jesus and make sure that they never focused on him. Boy, that's an example for all of us. Can I get an amen? So point number one, in fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty, have an eternal focus. Number two, remain humble, broken, and desperate. Look what it says in verse seven. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Oh, the abundance. So it wasn't just the one revelation about Ly- that happened at Lystra, but there was an abundance of revelations. And what he's saying is, there's many other things that God revealed to me, 
but he didn't reveal them to others if they applied only to him. But he says, in the abundance of the revelations, unless I get puffed up, he says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul had seen, well, just think about how Paul got saved. Amen? He's on his high horse or his high donkey, whatever he was riding, and he's riding on his way to Damascus, you know, go, go attack more Christians, and he has a head-on collision with Jesus Christ. A bright light shines, he falls off his horse, he's laying on the ground, and basically, Pastor Dave Frey Frey, he's like, who are you, Lord? Who are you? He knows it's the Lord, he just doesn't know who it is. He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, he was persecuting Christians, which means when you persecute Christians, you persecute Christ. Amen? And Paul repents. He's blinded. He's carried away. The town he thought he was going to march into and do great damage, he had to be led into blind. Got humbled. Can I get an amen to that? And it was there that he was taught and he was prepared to become the man that he was. But see, every one of these revelations could have been things that allowed him to get puffed up or caused other people to promote him. And, and then he said, but you know what God did? Satan brought a thorn in my flesh, and God allowed it. Think of Job, right? Satan, you know, Jesus, God the Father, and Satan are talking. Text, you know, consider my servant Job. And said, says, well, yeah, he loves you because he's got everything. He's got money, you know, he's wealthy, he's got cattle, he's got riches, he's got a family, he's got a wife. You know, let me take some of his stuff. We'll see. We'll see how much he loves you. And the Lord says, well, you can take whatever you want, you just can't kill him. And, you know, you fast forward a few chapters, he's sitting on an ash heap, covered in boils, everybody in his family's dead, all his riches are gone except for his wife, who says, why don't you just curse God and die? Satan knew what he was doing, letting her stay. <laughs> She's picking at him. And he said, shall I praise him in times of blessing? You know, he first said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Shall I praise him in times of blessing, not in times of adversity? Well, see, I think the same thing is true here of the thorn in the flesh. It came from the enemy, but God allowed it. And I believe God allowed it to keep him humble, broken, and desperate. And that's what Paul's about to say. See, lest I get puffed up in myself, God allowed something to come into my life. Even though Satan brought it, God allowed it to keep me from focusing on me and keep me on my knees crying out to the Lord. And you know, a lot of you in this room, you have these thorns in your flesh. Now, by the way, the word thorn there, it's not like the thorn where you, hey, I picked up a rose and I pricked my finger, ooh, put back teen and a Band-Aid on there. The word literally, that word for thorn there, it's a stake, like a, like a railroad's tie. It's a stake. And he said, I got a stake in my flesh. I've got a huge painful thing in my flesh that keeps me. Now, when it's talking about his flesh, it means his flesh. It means his body. So it's some kind of ailment in his body. It's not a thorn in his fleshly desires. It's not what it is. It literally talks about it. It's his fleshy matter. So he's got some kind of physical ailment that is a constant pain that keeps him on his knees. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what it is. Some have supposed it may have been his eyesight because when Paul was knocked off his high horse, he was blinded. And later you see in chapter, in books he's writing, he'll say, at the end, at this portion, the greeting, I'm writing in my own hand, and it talks about the, the writing being really large, so maybe he couldn't see very well, and he was transcribing the books because he couldn't see. That could have been it. Others believe, you know, physical ailments of all different types, and I actually believe that the Word of God doesn't tell us what it is on purpose, because it, because it applies to any thorn in the flesh that any of us could have. Can I get an amen to that? Now, again, he had a specific one, but all of us God keeps us humble. Again, I don't want to make this about me in any way, shape, or form, because a lot of you have far worse than I do, but in 1992, I went to Russia, and uh, I've had a parasite since 1992. I've been to more specialists than I can count. I don't want to get too graphic, but I pass blood. I have my stomach cramps all day, every day, and you know what? I prayed. I asked God to remove it. He didn't, so praise God for it. Can I get an amen to that? You got, a lot of you have far worse. I'm not trying to play ain't it awful or anything. I'm just saying that sometimes, you know what, God brings things into our life so that we will stay on our knees, which is the best place we could possibly be. Can I get an amen to that? 
See, the reality is, if we're on the, again, if everything was perfect, if you're lying down on green pasture, where's the shepherd? I don't know. Runner somewhere. But when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you're hanging on with both hands. And here we see the Apostle Paul saying, look, lest I get caught up in myself, lest I get, God allowed there to be a thorn in my flesh. Notice it was given to him. It was ordained by God. Again, even though it was given by Satan, it was ordained by God. It wasn't by chance. And again, much like Job in the Old Testament. And it says, notice what it says here at the end of that verse. A thorn in my flesh to buffet me. The word buffet means to beat me, to smite with the hand, or to hit with the fist. That's what it means. It's to, it's to when I get puffed up, hey, <laughs> right? It's to buffet me. It's to keep me in a place where my eyes belong, where my focus belongs, when I start getting puffed up. Anybody else here ever get puffed up besides me? Am I the only one that gets puffed up sometimes? Amen. I have to be very careful when I go to sales awards trips. I do, because they always ask me to speak, and all these people come up and talk to me and tell me how amazing I am. And if I'm not careful, I believe it. <laughs> can I get an amen? Wow, man, you know, wow, can you mentor me? Can you, you know, can you, you know, and that guy taught me everything I know. You know, throwing up all over me. And I just say, guys, without him, I can do nothing. Jesus did it. Amen. It's the grace of God. To Him be all the glory. Can we say amen to that? Amen. And it's too easy for us to listen to the praise of men. You know, if someone praises you, I couldn't quite hear that. Could you say that one more time? I, I, I was distracted. <laughs> Tell me one more time how amazing I am. You know what I mean? And there's this mentality. And Paul, praise God, he recognized, you know, God gave me a thorn in the flesh because, you know, I would get puffed up sometimes. And God was keeping me on my knees, keeping me humble, keeping me broken, keeping me desperate lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So did Paul pray and ask God to deliver him? What's the answer? Now, according to the Word of Faith movement, what should have happened? Should have been healed. I've talked to people that told me, yeah, I have faith. I never get sick. I never get sick. I will never get sick again. I have so much faith, I will never get sick. I'm like, wow, I guess the Apostle Paul should have took some faith lessons from you. (laughs) By the way, how do you die? I'm just asking. I've asked a few people that. Well, you're sick. Well, if you never get sick, how do you die? With your faith, you should just live forever. How do you die? Well, I I believe at that time, I'll like Jesus, I'll let go of my spirit. Oh, stop it already. Here's the reality. Guys, it's not faith in faith. It's faith in Christ, and we don't tell God what to do, and it's not our faith that determines the outcome. Guys, we don't change God's mind. God changes our hearts. Can we say amen to that? Now, we need to be people of faith. We, we have not because we ask not, so we should pray for it, and we trust that God can do it. But is God still in control, even if he says no? See, Paul prayed three times, and he could have prayed 300. Now, did he pray three times and give up? No, I believe Paul just knew that God said no. See, God answers all our prayers. Sometimes he says no. Amen? And if he says no, it's for his glory and to mold us more into the image of His Son so we should praise Him when we get a no. Amen? Pastor Chuck shares this story, he shares at uh, pastor's conferences that he was in Bible college and there was a woman that was in school there that he met. He was just, he was convinced it was supposed to be his wife. And he said, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. This is supposed to be her. This is the woman God has for me. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with her. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And God said, no. She married somebody else. And he said, I was heartbroken. He goes, then I met my, my beautiful wife, Kay. And man, and that's, and Pastor Chuck was the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement. God used him to plant thousands of churches. And he said, you know what's amazing? I went back to a Bible college reunion like 25 years later. And there was this woman walking around the place screaming and yelling at her husband and pointing fingers at him and being obnoxious. And he knows I'm like, that's her. Thank you, Lord, for No. Can I get an amen? I trust in the sovereignty of God. When God says no, he knows better than me. We need to learn to trust him. He asked God to take it away. No doubt even saying, Lord, take it away so I can better serve you. And I think, I don't want to speak for God, but he might have said back to him, no, I'm going to let you keep it because you'll serve me better if you have it. Amen? It'll keep you desperate. 
and humble. It was God's plan to keep him humble. Praise God for that, verse 9. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Sufficient, the word there is to be possessed of unfailing strength, to have enough, to be content. What God gives us, you guys, is enough. Amen? The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think one of the biggest struggles in the church today is people struggle because they're never content. Amen? If I just get that promotion, then I'll be happy. If I could just get a little more money, if I could just do this, if I could just get that, if I get into the right school, if I get the right... And there's all these things, instead of being content right where we are, you know right where we are if we're born again? We're new creations in Christ, filled with the Spirit of the living God, and we're heaven bound. Can I get an amen to that? Godliness with contentment is great gain. And he says in that, my, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. See, when we are strong, we tend to, to trust in ourselves. And when we're weak, we cry out to God. It's in our weakness that we remain humble and broken and desperate. And I also believe this. I believe when we're humble, broken, and desperate is when we're usable by God. Amen? God doesn't use, cannot and will not use prideful men, at least not for long. But the humble and broken desperate can be used for the Lord. It says, the power, therefore, 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 most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, these false teachers were boasting in their charisma and boasting in, you know, uh, their revelations and boasting. And if Paul ever boasted, he boasted in his infirmities. He boasted in his human frailty. Because what he was saying was, look at me, look how frail I am, and God's doing this, does not prove how great God is. They can use someone like me. And too many people, they walk around going, well, of course God used me because I'm amazing. I wonder what God would do without me. God would be in trouble if I wasn't here. God doesn't need me, I need him. Amen? And Paul understood that. And Paul was in a place where he just remained humble. The word rest there is to cover uh, to, to cover, to tabernacle, to place a tent upon. Jesus tabernacles or dwells with you in your infirmities. Uh, they didn't need to be removed in his case. He needed to learn to rest in the Lord in his infirmity. Isn't it good to know in the midst of your infirmities that the Lord tabernacles with you, that he is there with you? Amen? And it's in that place, sometimes he will deliver you from it. Praise God, when he does, we're thankful for it. But sometimes he just stays with us in it. Amen? And praise God for that too. And I just love the example we're learning from the Apostle Paul here. Verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, I am strong. Now, we want to be like Paul, but some of us are like, dude, really? You take pleasure when you get distressed? You take pleasures in infirmities? You take pleasures, you know, in the attacks from the world. You take pleasures. Paul came to a totally new attitude toward the thorn in his flesh, no longer praying he would be delivered from it, but that, would God, that God would be glorified through it. It's through our infirmities, trials, and weakness that God has revealed to our families, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. When all this happened on Tuesday night with my mom and my son, I went and talked to my boss. And I let him know, because I was talking to my wife about leaving the conference and going home. I only had one day left in the conference, and I just said, I had a couple days left, and I said, you know, here's what's going on. And, and he started weeping. And he said, Pastor Dave, how are you standing there, bro? I said, well, I'm standing here because God's in control and he's faithful. Amen? And, and, that, and, and, and I'm on my knees, and I'm praying, and I'm desperate for God. But you know what? He's just as much in control today as he was yesterday. And he's just as faithful today as he was yesterday. Amen? And you know what? My, my boss must have sent me 30 text messages saying, and he's a believer. He's just, just saying, man, how, I, don't, I don't think I could do that. I said, bro, I can't do it either apart from Christ. Amen? And guys, see, the infirmities give an opportunity to point people to Jesus. Amen? The trials of this life. Guys, when we pray, we need to remember that God knows better than we do. We don't direct God like a wish-granting genie. He directs us. We openly and willingly submit to Him. 
Again, a man is a fool who tries to direct God. God answers Paul's prayer, but not the way he wanted to. And guys, God gives us what is best for our walk and for his glory. So when God says no, trust him. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Don't doubt. Trust him. Amen? Often the greatest answer to prayer is not delivering us from the circumstances, but taking us through our circumstances that we might experience his grace. There's a greater testimony, the joy in our circumstances. I think it's greater to have joy in your circumstance as far as a testimony to others. It's a greater testimony than just being delivered from it. Now, we praise God we're delivered from it. Can I get an amen to that? But I think a stronger testimony is having joy in the midst of it. So point number two, they're fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty and eternal focus, remaining humble, broken, and desperate, and then finally having a great love uh, and burden for people. Verse 11, I have become a fool in boasting. You've compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most intimate, eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it which you were inferior to other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you, Forgive me this wrong. Paul's being a little sarcastic at the end. Here's what he says. I am not behind anything that these false teachers are and the things that they're teaching you. And, and some would say maybe he's talking about the eminent apostles being Peter and James and John saying, I'm not behind them. What they would have delivered to you, I delivered everything in, equal to that or more. But then, I, here's why I believe it's the false apostles, because he says, the only thing, you know, you were given the truth, you were given everything, you've been blessed by God. He said, the only area where I've fallen short, I didn't ask you for any money. Where he says there in verse 13, um, except that I myself was not burdensome. He's talking about, I never, you never had to pay me. Paul made tents, served the people, didn't need any money from anybody. He said, you know, those, you know, these false apostles, that's what I think he's talking about. You know, they're, every time they come talk to you, they want a pile of money. And he said, you know, I wasn't, bur- so God, forgive me for not taking money from you. See, for Paul, it wasn't about what he could get from people, but what he could give to them. Paul had one heart to see people grow in their relationship with the Lord. Verse 14. Now, for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. You know, I love this. Paul says, look, I'm coming to see you, but when I come, I don't want anything from you. I just want you. I just want to bless you. I want to serve you. I want to love you. I want to minister to you. I want to see you grow in your relationship with the Lord. I'm not coming because I want anything from you. These other apostles traveled, or, you know, these other Judaizers, they would travel around and be getting rich everywhere they went. Sounds like a good portion of Christ- Christian television. Can I get an Amen. They'll have a crusade and charge 50 bucks a head to get in. I don't, help me out with that. By the way, the Harvest Crusade's coming. It's free. And the gospel will be preached. And if you've never been, your ticket in ought to be an unsafe friend. Amen? Bring someone that needs Jesus. We'll have more information as it gets closer. But notice here, he's just, he's letting them know in verse 14, I don't want anything from you. I just want you. For the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but parents for the children. Paul's referring himself as being their father in the faith. You know what? You're my sons and daughters. I don't want from you. I just want to give to you. It's, it can get out of hand sometimes, but I never let, you know, my, my daughter, my son-in-law, my grandkids, my boy, they never pay for anything in my presence. They just don't. Because I look at them as, even though they're grown, I just say, you know, they're my kids. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to do everything I can to bless them, encourage them, care for them, because I love them. They've stopped trying. They've always tried, but I won't let them. I'm just like, guys, look, I'm your dad. It's okay. You're, you being in my presence for dinner is more than worth me paying for the meal. I just want to be with you. I just want you. Amen? My 50th birthday, my wife said, if you could have anything, what is it? I said, I just want all my kids at a table. That's it. And I'll pay for it. Amen? This is Paul's heart as a father in the faith. I just, want what's, I, I just want you. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to bless you. I want to minister to you. I'm not looking to take from you. Verse 15, I love that. 
says, and I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. You know, Paul says, look, I love you. I will spend every waking moment. I will give all that I have to bless you. And even in the end, the more I give, the less I'm loved, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Guys, remember this for all of us. You were sent to be, to bless, not to burden, to esteem others greater than yourself, to love unconditionally, even if it's never returned, to spend all that you have until you're spent and to lay down your life completely for others. That's what we're called to do as Christians. Can I get an amen to that? And Paul's such an example that he's not raising up you know, his ministry or making his name great. He just wants to make the name of Christ great. And it's already great. Let's finish up. It says there, but be, as it, be it as it may, I do not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Verse 17, did I take advantage of you by any of these whom I sent you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ? But all we do, all we do all things beloved for your edification. See, Paul says to them very clearly, when we came to you, we never came with our own agenda and we never took from you. By the way, not only did I not take from you, everybody I sent to you, none of them took from you. All we did was come to bless you, to edify you, to teach you, to encourage you, to help you grow spiritually. That ought to be the heart of everybody in ministry, amen? And we've gotten so, so far away from it. How do you know you're a servant? By how you respond when someone treats you like one, amen? If you're truly a servant, it won't bother you. If you're just here to serve, be about it. Last two verses. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults. Lest when I come to you again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of this uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. See, Paul's personal life had been under attack. They said he lacked charisma And Paul's writing this letter from a heart of love and concern and exhortation. It was such a burden to see that they were not right with God. You know what breaks my heart more than anything? To see people who have tasted him, have known of him, and then choose to walk in open rebellion against him. My conversation with my son the day after this happened in jail was, I love you, son, I would die for you, but I'm so mad at you right now. And I'm mad at you because you're being selfish and you're buying the lie of the enemy again, your son was almost raised without his father, and the consequences are going to be so heavy. If this next six months changes your life, it'll be worth it. Amen? But you know what? There needs to be, there's a time when Paul, as gracious as he is, finally says, it's time to stop it. It's time to stop being caught up in fornication. It's time to stop. You know what? There's churches today. Come as you are. Jesus loves you right where you are. Let me tell you, Jesus died for you right where you are, but he didn't necessarily love right where you are. Can I get an amen to that? He doesn't love it when you're walking in an open rebellion. He doesn't love it. He loves you, but he doesn't love your behavior. Can I get an amen to that? And the truth is the same. You know, I love my kids no matter what, but there's sometimes I don't love what they're doing. And Paul ends this chapter by exhorting them. If I come to you and I find backbiters and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambition and all that you're doing, I'm going to mourn for many who have sinned. And I'm not repented. Guys, if, if you're living an unclean life, if you're living a life of fornication, if you're outside of God's will, guess what? It's time to repent. Amen? He loves you. He died for you. But he doesn't love what you're doing. Lord, help. God's wrath, wrath and righteous judgment is going to follow. Again, he's a God of grace and a God of love and a God of mercy. And he suffers long, but he won't suffer always. And amidst of the rebellion... Why didn't Paul just write him off? Well, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't just write us off? Aren't you glad that the Lord loved you and continues to love you even if you're backslidden? He wants you to come home. Can I get an amen? amen? So, fruitful and faithful in times of difficulty. First, an eternal focus, a true longing for heaven, seeing your suffering and trials in light of eternity. Number two, remain humble, broken, and desperate. 
Uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, you are made strong. And then finally, having a great love and burden for people. I will say this too lastly. When you come to church or when you do ministry or when you're in fellowship, your focus shouldn't always be and really should almost never be what's in it for me. I hear this from Christians all the time. Well, I used to go to that church and they used to just stop meeting my needs. They just weren't meeting my needs. I wasn't getting my needs met. You got a verse for that? Go here to get your needs met? We're called to serve. Can I get an amen to that? There comes a time, look, it's okay to be a ministry, but there comes a time when we go to, from being a ministry to a minister. Amen? Do you know what, what will bring me to tears when I think about you guys? When I think about you serving. When I, I know you're growing when you're serving more. And I'm not, look, I, please don't take that wrong. I'm not trying to recruit anybody for anything, okay? We've got plenty of servants here, amen? But if you, if, if you examine your own life, you will admit, the closer I get to the Lord, the more I want to serve. Can I get an amen to that? The closer I am to the Lord, the more I want to serve, the more I want to be used for his kingdom. And serving him is a get to, not a have to. And no one has to drag me to do it. I get to do this for Jesus. Are you kidding me? I get to put chairs away for Jesus. I get to bake cookies for Jesus. Amen? Bring them to church and people hang out. And some people get saved that way. Can I get an amen to that? I get to do overheads for Jesus. I get to lead worship for Jesus. I get to teach the children's man. It's a get to. There's such a great joy. And people, you know, we're, we're just checking out 50 churches or so to see who meets our needs the most. Well, it's not here. Just, just keep going. No fog machines here. Can I get an amen to that? It's not going to happen. And at the same time, I truly believe this with my whole heart, that this is one of the most loving fellowships around. Can I get an amen to that? This is one big family. Amen? And if you're new here, by the way, we adopted you when you walked in the door. And, you know, in the Church of Christ, right, guys, we don't, we don't uh, have membership here. You show up and you love Jesus, you're a part of the family. And if you've showed up and you don't know Jesus, we can fix that. You can give your life to him today. Can I get an amen? Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. I thank you for your, your grace in all of our lives this week. I thank you for the grace that you showed my son and my mom on this week as well. What a blessing, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you would give us a heart, an eternal perspective, Lord, always heavenly-minded so we can do some earthly good. Help us also, Lord, to remain humble, broken, and desperate, to never think it's us. Lord, to know it's always been you. And then, Lord, give us a supernatural love and a burden for others, a love for everyone and a burden specifically for those who are lost that don't know you. And Lord, I pray for everyone in this room, whatever they may be going through right now, whatever trial, whatever difficulty, Lord, they would take their eyes off their circumstances and put them on you. If anybody here today doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. The word says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. It's not just praying a prayer, mumbling some words, but it's a conscious choice to surrender your life to the Lord, to recognize Him for who He is. If that's your heart today, pray and ask Him to forgive you, and He will. Ask Him to fill you with your Holy Spirit, and He will. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we pray. I pray for everyone in this room, whatever they may be going through. I pray for those watching on live stream. Lord, be glorified. We pray for divine appointments. May we live our life out loud for you. May we finish strong with the time we have left. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name. We pray and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and close the worship song.